annuals table, the first few studies, the annuals table were 2018, 2019. Uh, that's very recent. Uh, I mean, we were looking back at economic studies that were done, you know, 20 years ago, and health just wasn't in there. And if they did include health, it were things like how many people in that exact city went to the emergency room that day for asthma. And so they'd say the health impacts from these huge well effects was eight hospital admissions or, or eight emergency department visits that totally um, missed the large smoke impacts that we heard about in the last session. So this is new. This is not something that uh, agency focused on for a long time. A second anecdote, um, I actually uh, was invited to testify for a US, representatives, uh, US House of Representatives Committee a couple years ago, specifically to talk about the need and the opportunity to provide more funding, federal funding for health research around wildland fires. And we worked with um, EPA staff and um, others who were involved with setting up the PM Research Centers in the late 90s. And we felt like that was the right structure to use to, to evaluate the health effects of wildland fires. So at that um, House committee, we proposed a $15 million structure to kind of fund it. Um, since then, we've had follow-up meetings over the last several years with OMB. And it was really exciting. Uh, President Biden's proposed budget for next year, had, they didn't do the full 15 million, but they put in 13.8 million and used our language we had given them for wildland fire health research, because it's a huge gap. If you saw in Daniel's presentation, um, they've done a great job doing the exposure assessment side of quantifying how much um, pollution is from wildland fires. But if you notice, the concentration response function he used for the health impacts was taken from the ACS cohort study, which is you know long-term exposures. Uh, and really it's looking at what's the mortality risk moving everyday exposure averaging 16 to 15, right? That's not how wildland fires work, you know? It's a subset of days with huge values. Uh, we need to develop new concentration response functions. We need to understand the health impacts in a more specific way and not just um, pull from other um, previously published studies. Okay? Uh, another point I'd like to share is uh, the reason that it hasn't been studied very effectively, how am I doing on time, by the way? Good. Uh, about how many minutes that's for Mark. Good. Um, um, I'll just talk until I'm done with anecdotes. Um, the, uh, the reason there has been a lot of effort focusing on the health impacts of smoke is the primary agency in the U.S. that's focused on wildland fires is the Department of Interior. And they don't really have a lot of expertise, or previously didn't have a lot of expertise on the air health interface, right? The EPA is kind of, that's their purview. Uh, and so because the DOI, they have been pushing the efforts for wildland fire management in the U.S., um, that's partly why it's been slow to uptake to address the health impacts of wildland fires. I was a part of a group that we organized an effort to bring together Department of Interior, um, agency officials, the key people, EPA, key officials, and then local air quality managers and health experts as well to discuss the state of the science and the state of policy and what we need to do moving forward. And it was great. That was several years ago. Uh, the key conclusion was the need for better federal coordination on the topic. Uh, we heard just recently, uh, about six months ago, from our Department of Interior contacts that they are now, for the first time, having meaningful engagement between the DOI and EPA to think about wildland fire management on a host of topics, um, in particular um, prescribed burns and other issues. Um, but that improved federal coordination hopefully will accelerate where we need to go, which I mentioned, which is understanding the real health impacts of the smoke, which hasn't been seen in the past. And like I said, we need to develop new infrastructure to deal with it. A uh, census section, section is focused on communication. I just want to leave with one thought on that. Um, our current AQI system was not intended to help inform risk of wildland fires. Um, that's not what it was designed for. Uh, we need to follow the lead of Canada, where they've taken a closer look at their air quality indices and seen how it performs specifically in wildfire events. When they did that, they found that they were left wanting, and so they made some adjustments to the air quality index. I think that we need to take a leadership role and help push forward and improve our risk communication based on the science we're familiar with and make sure it's specifically suited for wildfire health risks. Anyway, those are a few points I'd like to make. Uh, I appreciate you guys' time. Thank you. And we're, we're ahead of schedule. We've got up time. Um, so our, our next speaker is Cassie, and she's from the city of Fort Collins in Colorado. Awesome. Uh, Cassie, just one moment. We're going to unmute the microphone here and mute over. Uh, and then you'll be ready to go. Okay. And can you hear me okay? Uh, 
All right, perfect. Thank you. And I um, really appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, it looks like you can see my screen okay. Good. <laughs> I like the thumbs up. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm just a little bit of a cough was enough to make me not want to fly. Um, but I'm happy we're doing these virtual and hybrid options. So I'm Cassie Archuleta. I'm with the city of Fort Collins in Colorado. Let me go ahead and for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with the city of Fort Collins. Um, I'm an air quality manager for um, city government, so the local government. And so I appreciate these kind of opportunities. And I heard yesterday about that intention on these panels of having both HACAS members and stakeholders. And, and I like that mix because as a local government representative, I mean, it's really important for us to be part of this conversations. And I'm just learning so much, just even virtually watching in these last couple of days. So a little more about Fort Collins. One really important aspect is we're home to Colorado State University. And I'm also an alumnus of Colorado State. So graduated from the atmospheric science program there. Um, and that's part of what helps connect us to these kind of things. So Jeff Pierce, who I know is also on this panel, um, helps connect the city government to these types of opportunities and many of our other collaborators at CSU. So I won't spend a lot of time on this slide because this is the kind of thing preaching to the choir, but in Fort Collins, we do survey our community members and one in four, this pie chart on the left represents that one in four members of our community report that they have a member in their household with some kind of respiratory condition, which is why it's important um, in Colorado and elsewhere to talk about air quality. We are part of an ozone non-attainment area. Um, a lot of our community members are talking more about air quality than they have before, in part because, you know, there's a heightened awareness of respiratory health um, and respiratory concerns and how that affects our vulnerable populations, especially. We're growing, um, we have a lot of commuters, and most pertinent here, wildfire smoke. It's becoming a routine concern, a relatively routine concern in the summer. And we have other issues in Port Collins, too, like we have quite a bit of oil and gas not as much as Texas per se, but quite a bit of oil and gas just east of us. Um, so just a little bit more about our program in our community. We started with an air quality program back in the early 90s. Usually um, this is a role of a county health department. So it's a little bit unique, I think, to have a municipal air quality program. It gets us a lot of flexibility in what we do. Um, we have an air quality advisory board, which is a really key part of this. This is a community advisory board and they drive a lot of what we work on as a community. So it keeps us pretty connected. And we also have that place close to our community to develop policy. So how does research like this and conversations like this get incorporated into local policy is one of the conversations that we'd be poised to have and are having. And um, we do have an air quality plan and we talk about things like what can we measure, what can we control, how do we promote resilience, most pertinent here. How can we incorporate more of that satellite type measurement data and messaging into what we measure and model to then inform what can we control? How can that impact local policies? And how do we promote a more resilient community? We have a website. So even right now, um, this is kind of a portal to our community. We use standard type stuff. So air quality index information, we just pulled out from the EPA. We have mapping tools. Um, and we're working with CSU right now, actually, to look at our mapping tools and see how maybe more PM data, more low cost sensor data can get incorporated to create potentially contour maps to get better spatial representation. Like how can a local community website be more of a portal for information like this? Like how can we consolidate into that? kind of information is an opportunity and certainly something that we discussed with CSU and other partners. How do we continue to make that kind of community resource better to give people sort of a one-stop shop? So yeah, I think um, one of the common themes I hear, there are just too many resources. So as a community member, people just don't know where to look sometimes. So there's an opportunity with local governments. Um, this slide just highlights, so this is one of those things that um, people really relate to. And I think there's opportunity here for more satellite information, definitely more spatial representation of PM. But people in our community really, and most places really relate to visible perceptions of haze and air quality. 
So we have a number of cameras. This one in particular is located at New Belgium Brewery in Fort Collins and it overlooks our cityscape. And then online you get live updates and you can actually toggle on, on and off these landmarks. So if you're not outdoors or you want a fixed image, like you can use something like this visibility scale, which is related to the AQI to just get a really ready indicator. Um, Cause as we've talked about, like sometimes you can smell the smoke, sometimes not. So the nose is not always the best indicator. The eyes can be a good indicator when you don't have other information. And so we get a lot of website hits on our visible camera images when fires start in our community. And related to that, I just wanted to show like one of the pipe dream things for City of Fort Collins. Like I'd love to have more integrated information to talk about urban visibility standards. I know that there are things like this maybe in Denver or the East Coast, definitely with our park system um, in our rural areas with the regional haze rule, but how do we talk about that more in an urban landscape? So relating those fires and haze and other sources of haze and visibility to an urban visibility standard and curious about how um, satellites might add more to that. So most pertinent to this conversation though, um, wildfire smoke. So one of our biggest ones, actually this is the biggest fire in Colorado history to date, the Cameron Peak fire that was in 2020, that burned through December, had some of our longest duration of haze, poor air quality, um, and it was coming at a time, same time, of course, the first of COVID impacts. So we went from having some of our cleanest air quality measurements that spring in about March 2020, you know, when transportation was shutting down, um, got very, very clean, to some of our dirtiest air quality days in over two decades, all in the same year. Um, so it was quite a year and a lot of people were very interested in respiratory health and respiratory concerns. So conversations really heightened in 2020. How do we support some of those? Um, we do provide things like guidance for air quality events. One of the most common questions we get as a municipality is, hey, should we have this run? Should we host this run? Should this baseball game go on? Should this softball game go on? Um, we're not necessarily like making rules around that as municipal government, but we offer some guidance for people and organizers to make decisions. And we offer other information, which basically repeats a lot of what like comes from the EPA or groups like this, like what's the best research on that? How can we best translate that for our community is the lens we often have. Um, I put on this, this little fired up about wood smoke thing. I just threw that one on there because we also have programs around backyard wood smoke. So having a backyard wood fire is legal in our community and causes some concerns because um, we're a pretty dense community. So my team also manages nuisance complaints. A benefit there is it raises awareness about particle pollution. Um, so people become more aware and that also can help when there's a large wildfire, when it's not such a localized concern. And then our social media. So I mentioned we get a lot of visibility camera hits when fires are going on. This is an example of what we might post on social media. And we'll grab an image and tell people where to go get these images and give them some advice on how they can protect themselves and be more resilient. Um, so, and back to groups like this, like City of Fort Collins is very interested in how we can be a platform for more conversations to get the best of the research, to get best of the information to our community. Um, we partner with the county on that. We have a few things going on with CSU and the Atmospheric Science Department. Um, I put on the seams thing that was actually um, not a city of Fort Collins thing, but it, there was a citizen science opportunity and we connected some of our staff and folks to that. And that was one aspect of that was citizen science measurements to get to that aerosol optical depth related to, I believe, calibration of satellite data. So there are definitely citizen science opportunities and can be accessible through local governments. Um, we're also partnering with some private industry to get more monitoring in our school district as well. So these opportunities for mes messaging. So yeah, bottom line here is like, how can cities be a platform to connect to community voices and priorities and better integrate some of these conversations into like how we ultimately get into policy and also help with public communication and outreach and empowerment really. And that's all I brought. So thanks again. Good. Our, our next speaker is going to be uh, Steve Moran, standing in for Kellen. 
I do, yes. Here, let me pull them up really quick. Um, the slides are coming in. I'm following good luck, Pika. Our stage went for him. He's everywhere. Just making sure the Zoom folks can see it. Thank you. Thank you for stepping up and doing this. Uh, sure. Good thing I didn't read the title. <laughs> All right, we're good to go here. And I can advance your slides too. Great. Thank you. I, uh, thanks for inviting me and slipping me in at the last minute. It was a, actually a uh, flash talk yesterday, but it got pulled out and put into this uh, session. So I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, a lot of you may or may not have heard of Pizometer. Presometer, not presumptive. I'm a trade type of person. When I joined the company, it took me a minute to get re educated about how you pronounce it. Uh, so I've been with the company for uh, about four months. Um, my background is in the civil space. So I, I started out at NASA headquarters back in 1979. So I spent a uh, number of years at OSTP doing civil space things. For Raytheon for a long time, so I'm very familiar with the uh, uh, and Games instruments. Um, and this is new, so I'm learning about the quality of wildfires and pollen uh, and how you, how you monitor and forecast that around the world. And so, what I'll talk to you today about is the science behind two of uh, these on the three uh, global models. We have uh, an air quality global model that also takes into account. Fire smoke. We have a global pollen model, which is maybe the only global pollen model in the world. Uh, and we have a wildfire model. Uh, just for background, uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so, in terms of air quality, uh, Apple has incorporated our air quality data in their Apple Weather app. So, if you, if you use an iPhone and you have the weather app, and you scroll down and see uh, quality data that's provided by the examiner, get a link to our website. Uh, this is just a, uh, a heat map of our air quality um, data, and you can see what kinds of constituents we report out on there. Um, we have our own app as well online that you can download, but it's really rudimentary. Most of our data just goes uh, through an API uh, that either businesses or government people uh, access. Next slide. So, um, how do we do it? Uh, you can see on the left here uh, one of the one of the uh, differentiators for our company is the uh, large science team that we have and the large data, uh, data management team. Steve, one quick question. Could yep. you move here and yep. get us closer so yep. that the folks in Zoom can hear they're just having a little trouble? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, no, no worries. Thank you so, so much. So you can see on the left the, uh, the um, different data layers that we take into account in our air quality model. Uh, everything from uh, weather, live traffic data globally, uh, terrain and land cover. We use the terrain to correct uh, pixel size and pixel shape. Uh, from the satellite data and then land cover to understand, for example, in wildfires, what, what is burning. Uh, we do have uh, partnered with some uh, low cost sensor providers for air quality, but primarily depend on the, on the government monitor stations. Uh, so we compare continually our model output with the, what we consider the ground truth of the government monitoring stations. Uh, I did mention we bring in uh, global uh, real-time traffic models, weather models. Uh, we're, we're pretty heavy users of satellite data, uh, Gears and Modus clearly, uh, uh, the GOES, uh, Himawari, other, other geostationary systems worldwide. Uh, and then we also use the HER uh, smoke model in our global model. 
So this is one of the areas of expertise that we have. It's how to do that data fusion. Uh, another is in all the magic that happens with the algorithms, uh, uh, bringing in the dispersion models. And we do a lot of uh, machine learning driven uh, algorithms, and then also the big data analytics. And we serve this out. Uh, our air quality model is, has a resolution of five meters globally. Uh, that's primarily in the large cities. Uh, Apple right now is, they're rolling out country by country. Uh, they eventually want to have global air quality in their, in their uh, weather app. But right now, I think they're doing US, UK, Germany, uh, Spain, Australia. And then they, they've given us a whole list of countries that they, they want to roll out in the future. Uh, and we'll be able to support all that. Uh, OK, next slide. So this is how we bring in wildfire smoke into our uh, air quality model. Uh, again, it's satellite based for our, for our wildfire model. We use uh, uh, geostationary and full opening satellites for initial fire detection as well as for defining our, our dynamic wildfire perimeters. And we report out on every wildfire globally that's greater than 500 acres. Uh, and again, all of these models are global models. So this is how we bring the, the wildfire smoke uh, into our air quality model. And I believe next I'll talk about our pollen model. Would you go to the next slide? Yeah. Yeah, so we also have a, a global pollen model, and uh, we report out on probably 14 or so different types of pollen from tree pollen to, to uh, weed pollen, grass pollen around the world. And the way we do that, similar to our air quality model, if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that we bring in uh, a lot of data. Next slide. Uh, uh, from vegetation and land cover, uh, production curves, so we know what the pollen production looks like for different plant species, uh, given the environmental conditions, so we adjust the, the start date, the, the uh, maximum and the end date of the, of the pollen production, and, and adjust that by the uh, weather and climate factors for local uh, data, and then take into account other phenological factors, and then the weather and climate data. And again, we could compare our model output with whatever is ava available globally as the government kind of ground truth uh, for, for pollen. There's not a lot of that. So uh, we have a lot of uh, the large pharmaceutical companies are, are really interested in our data, especially those that serve uh, uh, allergy sufferers. And, and on all of our models, we, content, we do continuous uh, 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 accuracy and validation checks on our, on our uh, model output, uh, continually comparing them to ground source, uh, tr ground truth data. Uh, and we publish those uh, uh, accuracy and validation checks. Uh, and then uh, for our direct customer apps, we, we publish everything in heat maps and, and, uh, and through an API as well uh, to, to our business and government customers. Uh, next slide. So this is how we do uh, our reporting out of, of our air quality and pollen accuracy and validation checks. Like I said, we're continually running uh, in the background accuracy and data validation checks. We, we run our model, our global model hourly for, for all three models, uh, uh, air quality, pollen, and, and wildfires. Uh, and for example, here, this is where we could compare uh, our forecast or our now cast with the, the existing uh, ground, ground sensor data and, and then publish our uh, accuracy versus uh, ground truth. One of the things we do is uh, on an hourly basis, we'll take where well, we do have dense networks of uh, ground sensor data. We will pull one of those um, ground stations out, 
look at what our model forecasts for that point, for instance, here's a profound sensor station, we'll pull that, okay, I'm almost done. Uh, we'll pull that out, uh, compare our model output with uh, the ground sensor uh, data for that point, uh, and that's what we report out is the accuracy difference. Uh, so we call that the lead one out method. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is just a, a picture of the, uh, the weather app. This is the uh, Apple uh, weather app showing air quality. Uh, and in this app, we also have medical recommendations uh, for particular uh, uh, symptom categories. So if it's allergy sufferers or uh, things like that, we, we actually have to take it down to the medical recommendation. And then for Apple Maps, they've incorporated our wildfire tracker in Apple Maps. So that if you're trying to get from point A to point B and there's a, a wildfire in the way, you'll get a pop up saying, hey, there's a wildfire here. It'll give you uh, rerouting instructions. We're working closely with a lot of connected health companies uh, and, and the automotive industry, for instance, is, is very interested in uh, using air quality data to advise drivers and passengers on how to handle the uh, air quality along the route they're going to be doing. We've got companies that are looking at uh, doing cleanest route uh, maps. So, you know, if you, if you are a, an allergy sufferer and you don't want to be driving through poor air quality, you can get uh, uh, different routes for the, the cleanest air quality uh, for the point you're trying to get to. Next slide. These are just some of the uh, global companies we work with. You'll see a lot of the big pharmaceutical companies on there. We're not allowed to use Apple's logo, Google's logo, logo but uh, we do provide data to Apple, Google, Yahoo, and others. Um, but a lot of connected health, a lot of big pharma companies using our data. And I think I only have maybe like one or two slides left. What's that? Okay, so I have two slides. If you want to get more information about we publish, we're very transparent about how we do this. We publish a lot online. So there's links here to better understand uh, what's, what's behind our, our data. And then the next slide is just for Paula. That's it. Next speaker, I think, is coming up behind me, Jeff Pierce. And he's going to talk about the scribe burning in the central U.S., modifying the smoke exposure and understanding community perspectives. Thanks. So I'm going to lead this talk, talk about our tiger team, and build off of Amber Soya's talk yesterday on the detection and quantification of small fires and smoke from small fires. I'm going to try to connect this to Giovanna Henry's talk, flash talk yesterday, on the importance of understanding the needs and communication for communities that you're working with. So this is our Tiger team led by Cheryl Nachman and Amber Soya, but this whole thing is a Tiger team. I've just sort of broken out my colleagues at Colorado State. Um, and then our stakeholder groups that have brought us in are from Kansas, so the Kansas Department of Health and Environment and the Kansas Sierra Club. So we've heard a lot about wildfires today, and now we're gonna switch and think about prescribed fires, agricultural rain, rangeland fires that create a different culture and a different need for these communities. And there's also this critical gap in monitoring of PM particulate matter concentrations there where, the, where satellites can really help and inform us. So this is a count of satellite detected fire days in 2020. 2020, we just heard about how bad of a wildfire year this was. But if we were just thinking about fire counts, here's the Western US, and then here's the sort of central and southeastern US that Amber talked about yesterday. So just purely by fire number, the central and southeastern U.S. still dominate based largely on agricultural rangeland and prescribed fires, even though this is the catastrophic fires that make the news. And so I want to juxtapose here Colorado, where I live. This is 2017. So this is from the EPA National Emission Inventory. So this wasn't a huge wildfire year in Colorado. Wildfires are here. And that's just sort of what we had this year. This, is Kansas, and as you can see, so this is what NEI classifies as prescribed, which is 
fires that are non-agricultural, and this is agricultural, which is still prescribed, but either on rangelands or farmlands. And this is the total emissions of particulate matter from these sources. And just look at that from Kansas, all that's prescribed agricultural fires, and just how like, huge that is. And we don't talk about it that much. It's interesting. So most of these fires happen in this Flint Hills region of, uh, in eastern Kansas. And the burning there has been gone, has gone on as long as humans have been living in this area. And there's many good reasons to have fires there, it, in, uh, have prescribed fires there. It decreases the risk of having uncontrolled wildfires in that region. It helps maintain the ecosystem by keeping away invasive species that tend to creep in. And it also increases the nutrition for livestock. And as I'll show in a, in a couple of slides based on work from Amber's group, that this tends to have the burning tends to happen in April, which is sort of the nexus of when it's safe to have prescribed fires, as well as timing it such that cows can then go in and graze off this fresh grass that's coming out of the ashes a couple of months later. And just to show the extent of the burning in a given year, this is again, this is that Flint Hills region now broken out by county. And the red area is what has burned versus not burned. And it's just striking to me just how high a fraction of it. So people who live in the rural areas there that own lots of land, many of them try to burn every year, every other year. It's just more people in the rural areas burn than don't burn in, in, in our properties. So of course, you know, I talk about these good reasons for fire. There's also gonna be smoke for this. Um, and of course the people who are burning are aware of the smoke and, and, and as we'll talk about later, have a sense that the smoke can be bad, but there isn't a lot of quantification of what that smoke is. Um, so be before I get to that, I just wanna, then point out April. So this is work from uh, Emily Gargolinsky and Andrew Stoya using MODIS products to quantify the burn area and sort of focusing on the fact that most of it's in April, this yellow. And there's a lot of venture annual variability, which I believe is due to like how safe it is to burn in given years. Some years it may be drier, maybe windier, and there's less burning. And then they you know, make up for it in the next year where you can. So a lot of it is in the spring, which tends to be the safest time to do it in April. And then this is just sort of showing that seasonal cycle and how obvious it is when you put it in each line here at the different year. All right, so an interesting thing here is though that the smoke tends to peak in the mid to late afternoon. Now, for those of you who work with polar orbiting satellites like MODIS or VIRS, you have a 1030 overpass of MODIS and you have a 130 overpass of MODIS and VIRS. And so I'm gonna start this GOES animation um, at 1.30 and just show for these types of things where you have this daily cycle that peaks in the late afternoon, how important it is to have satellites that goes in tune tempo to understand the air quality effects that don't happen to align with our polar orbiting overpass times. So I think I can start it here. Okay, so this is starting at 1.30 and you can tell when the sun sets, which are, I guess this is April. Um, during 2020, and this is a typical year, and the sun will set probably around seven. And so here's our Flint Hills region, there's fires elsewhere, but just look at how smoky this gets, and this is not an abnormal day. That whole area, and you can see it's really between Wichita and Topeka, Kansas City, so in between where the cities are, and that smoke builds up, and this happens frequently throughout the month of April. Okay, so here's our smoke tends to build up in here, eventually it does transport heat typically. And here are our regulatory monitors and the smoke happens in between them. And so, yes, eventually the smoke will probably affect over to people, Kansas City and, and so on. And you'll then get an idea of what people are breathing, but people are breathing in this rural area in between what, what they burn. And we don't have a, a long-term regulatory record of that. So this, is where our stakeholders came in and said, we want to help understanding this. And so we had sort of this three-pronged approach of quantifying smoke PM by combining low-cost surface monitors with satellite data, driving burn area from satellites and connecting this to smoke exposure to sort of have this connection of when a certain amount burns on a certain day, what is, this, what is the expected smoke in the region? And then sort of the neat things that we have since we have communication re science research members on our team, is understanding what the community members' perspective are on fire and smoke. The smoke is part of the, I mean, fire is part of the culture here and necessary to maintain the ecosystem. So what do they actually perceive and what type of communication needs do they have? 
So again, in blue, these are the regulatory monitors. And then in purple are the existing public purple air monitors. So when we add in the existing low cost monitor network for Blair, we do get some better coverage, but still mostly limited to cities like Lawrence and Manhattan, where there are universities. But the, the bulk of the Foothills region still has no monitoring. And so you could see just how different the smoke and not smoke was in that animation before. So we could go entirely to the satellite, but we still need to then guess on what that PM or have some information on what that PM 2.5 to AOD ratio is to translate it. So what Callan on our team organized was citizens in the area to take up additional purple air monitors and fill in this whole big area here. And just, it's just amazing. This is all through personal contacts, different people from our stakeholder organizations writing to community members to take up these purple air monitors. And so for this spring, this was our coverage. And you can see just between two of the monitors we put out that are only about 50 kilometers away, this is two days worth of PM 2.5. And you can see, particularly here when this was a burning day, you can see there's very different temporal um, times of when the smoke hit and how much the smoke hit just between two neighboring monitors. And if you went over here, they might not have gotten any smoke at all. So what graduate student Olivia Sablon is now starting to work on is taking the AOD measurements and combining with this to get a full map, understanding you know, what is the value from the AOD alone versus when you have the AOD combined with just regulatory monitors versus when you have it combined with low cost sensors and trying to look at what different amounts of information we get from each of these sources. And then Amber and Emily come in, both through giving us the fire burned area perspective from the traditional satellite product, but also this really unique thing they do by taking the high resolution satellites, as Amber talked about yesterday, and then digitizing and getting this very high confidence in the burn area, where you can see from one day where it hadn't burned, then it's very obvious that it burned. And then not long after, sometimes within a day or two, they then plowed or tilled those fields and you can no longer see the obvious burn scar. And then finally, this unique aspect of our cyber team is this communication research by Giovanna, as well as another graduate student, Billy Rosen, where they've interviewed a range of community members with different roles. As you can see, ranchers, firefighters, landowners, many of whom actually burn on their property themselves. Um, and they conducted these in the middle of the burn season this just a month or two ago with the following research questions. So what risk perceptions exist for the air quality effect of the fish fire burn? How do these risk perceptions influence their protective actions or whatever their intentions or their behaviors are during the time of the burning? And then what risk communication efforts are there surrounding the health context of agricultural burn? And how can those communication efforts be more effective? So we're trying to do the complete circle between helping to quantify the smoke and then understanding how the, the best way to communicate with people so that they can take protective actions and then work with our stakeholder groups to help improve this communication and full circle of what's happening in the region. So just to give a few findings, and, and Giovanna gave some of these yesterday as well, in terms of how currently aware that people are in this region of smoke, they are, most people are generally unaware of there being any um, formal communication about smoke, which is quite different from my experience in Colorado, and maybe I'm biased because I work in smoke and I know the people who give the smoke warnings and so I pay attention to them. But there is a lot, we heard from Cassie from the city of Fort Collins, which is where I live, talk about this, you know, the communication efforts there. But the people who were um, interviewed were generally unaware of any formal communication in this region. Two of the 18 mentioned checking air quality monitors. So we guess that they probably, because they're, as we showed, there weren't regulatory air quality monitors in that region, if they check Kansas City, it's not going to be representative from where they live anyway. And then in terms of smoke awareness, they're just using their senses. And this is some of the things that have come up throughout this, um, throughout this session, both the sight of the smoke as well as the smell of the smoke. And this is going to be fresh smoke, so it will have that very distinct smell uh, of the smoky smell. And then in terms of risk perceptions, and I've learned a lot from this. So Correctly, the participants in this region believe that the air quality was good in eastern Kansas, which is true, except for during burn and harvest season. So that checks out with what an air quality scientist would understand too. Uh, the participants were concerned about health risks, 
such as various respiratory outcomes, as well as the health risks if something goes wrong. They use this drip system in order to put fuel on to like set the area on fire. And if something goes wrong with that, they're concerned with health risks from that. And then this is what I find super interesting. And in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense. So of the participants that were interviewed from the more rural locations, these are places where they are either burning themselves or their neighbors are burning. Their primary concern during these periods is not the smoke itself, even though they may have some concerns about it, but they're worried about the smoke, or the fire itself spreading larger than a larger area than was intended in affecting either the burning of their house or their barns or killing their cows. Andrew mentioned this yesterday when these things get out of control. Um, there can be a lot of loss in these regions. On the other hand, the people who were interviewed who lived in the urban areas or suburban areas where there's not the fire there, their predominant concern was actually the, okay, well, smoke just affected to us. Now we're breathing in. Um, what, what do I need to do on these days? When that happens? And so we're just starting to get these types of messages or understanding from that science. And um, overall, we just want to put all this together from smoke exposure um, and all the way to risk communication and then move back and, and meet with our stakeholders. And thank you. Not the, the logos. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, if all the panelists could come up, we'll do a little Q&A session. Yes, uh, nothing's uh, online quite yet. So if there's any questions in the field, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, Jeff, I'm, I'm kind of curious then, connecting to last year, I've been hearing from South Dakota that in recent years they've seen more and more um, they have to in the sense that they burn the land. And I was kind of looking at your graph, and it looks like to me maybe there's an uptick that more and more is burning. Yeah, what do you think, Amber? I think there's, um, you would expect it with climate change, but I, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that if anything, if you talk to people that want more fire on the landscape, they would say that it's decreasing the need a lot more. Carol Baldwin, Kansas State University, our last week at a fire climate conference. I defer oh, yes. to Also, well, um, well, we uh, have to look at the data. Yeah. Before we go on, uh, whenever you ask a question, panelists, if you could repeat the question. Oh. Sorry about that. So the question was, in, has there been um, an increase in the Flint Hills so that it's transported to South Dakota? More, more often. Like, more often. Well, that would be transport. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it could be that or it could be more emission. It sounds like it's not more emission, so it's naturally related. Did anyone else want online want to uh, add to that or? We have another question online or here or discussion. Just want to talk about stuff. I have a question for Rick or Donna. The the risk perception piece. That's a, a is that just the initial kind of qualitative assessment or do you plan to do it more systematically and build some kind of a you know structural equation model to take out the true predictive factors. You want to take that? Um, I think we're starting there first. It's just to take the risk perception. Um, honestly, we're still like in the very beginning stages of this because I was coding literally like where I walked up the road to some of those trends. So it's kind of still at a speaking stage at this point. So. I think the monitors are still out. Yeah, yeah. They're, I, so they're, no, are they still out? Are they're they? starting to get shipped back. Okay. And but the but the main burning season is over now. We're we're kind of have it out a little longer to get the baseline people on after. So, yeah. Related to that, I was wondering if any of the questions that you asked were what do you think about fire? Is there good fire on the landscape? I mean, do you think fires are good? So what are the positive aspects of the burning? Um, it was all about risk, but not about why are you doing this? It's not about the good stuff. We did have questions on risk, but we also had questions that had to do with 
their actual views on fire. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about today, I don't know if you're going to that came up with a lot of the social aspect and the historical aspect of the stories because it's a huge part of um, who they are as people and and it makes up what the people part is and it's a community event in a lot of ways for people to burn together. And so people, I mean people would actually go and like um, chase fire, I guess I could just do it and like take pictures and it's a thing that people did as a community. And and on the, the idea of like ecosystem or or health or things like that, um, a lot of people care a lot about the way that the land was being taken care of and making sure that you know those fires were there to actually push back invasive species that can take over other things or you know um, remove animals and bugs that that really did the land. Right. So so I mean I, I guess a follow up question would be what are their realistic options to change behavior? Because they have to do it in the field with the fire, with the smoke. What can they do to avoid the risk? Um, so not everyone is in the field burning on every day. There's still people in that community, even if they do burn on their property, they might not be burning on that property on that day. And they still can take the same home protective actions that Mary talked about in the discussion of the last um, case where you could stay in your home if you happen to have air purifiers or put a MERV 13 filter if you happen to have forced air in your home, um, th those sorts of things. And maybe in the field, you can wear an N95 mask or, or those sorts of things. Can I comment on this as well? I think this is an important point, which is we should be concerned with modifiable risk factors. If you can't do anything about it, it, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense to beat the drum. I also really like Jeff's project, asking local perceptions of what they care about. I, I made me think um, several years ago, I worked with Mexico City's EPA for about four years. We overlapped the large consulting firm that worked with them. And at one point we all came together to say, should we sync up? And this consulting firm, they had this idea of, the public doesn't know it, but this is a huge problem. So let's spend all our effort convincing them it's a huge problem. So let us do something about it. And I feel like that's a little bit backwards. I think it's better to listen to what the, the public actually cares about and then provide them with the tools to address that problem. And so I think it's really insightful. You're, you're being aware of what they actually care about. It's really great. Thank you for that. I have a question for Steve. Actually, um, we, had a, we had a pretty good discussion yesterday during dinner about self app. Does this have come to our Offer to us this self map is something really of interest to general public about air quality, and we do not have good self map at least before we know this resometer. Or my question for you is that how do you think that we can customize in a way that, for example, I'm working on Alaska, we got a satellite layer, we got a model forecast. Is this something you can customize your app or something that you can open source some way we can do that from an amateur like us? To, to think about, okay, we have a research product, but we want helping to know like visibility. We have stakeholders, they want to know the visibility in Alaska during fire season. It is something we have data, but we just don't know how to convey that information yeah. to the public. Yeah. So, I mean, we, ha we have public facing apps and then you can go on the app store and download it comes on the app. Um, but that's probably the level of information that the public, uh, we care about uh -huh. our, our APIs give you a lot more data that you would need for doing research or uh, or studies, historical studies. That kind of thing. Our, our public facing is, is probably what the general public. Okay, but you want to I don't know how our app does in, in Alaska. Uh -huh. I haven't really tried that. I just heard that yet last night. I just uh, it's, it's interesting. My you know, I've I've had more questions raised in my mind here about how we do our modeling than than I've had answers. So, okay. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Yeah. And Cassie might want to address that. I mean, is uh resometer? Is resometer uh something that you think uh the city uh your city would be interested in? 
possibly like a situation we're facing is there are a lot of tools like how do we um, incorporate say EPA fire and smoke map how do we incorporate like CSU is also pulling in some modeling and contouring so we have kind of an all of the above and how do we pull that together into like the best of all of the worlds like Breeze meter I guess my concerns might be like there's proprietary information in that which might be of concern if a local government's going to use that um, so we'd have to explore some different things than maybe what we explore with using EPA tools or working with CSU. So yeah, I don't know, but I certainly know that there's interest in having more consolidated tools so that public isn't exposed to a multitude. Um, Have you go here? Can I see one sec? Sure. Could somebody repeat that for me? An in increase in demand. Oh, sorry. One sec. Oh, could you do that one more time? Yeah. Do you see in Fort Collins an increase in people wanting to have their own um, monitors at their homes, like Purple Air, to to have their own information? Oh, absolutely. Actually, and we've been thinking about how to even put more of that on our maps. When I last checked the fire and smoke map, like. It ballooned in 2020 and after. Like I think it went from a few peppered here and there to it's probably about 40 consolidated just within city limits. And it keeps growing. Every time I check, there are a few more. Um, so it's a pretty savvy community who wants to be very involved in that community aspect. And then even that I mentioned outdoor fire pits, people are very concerned about what's happening at their home in a very localized way, too, in addition to the larger wildfire impacts. So we're seeing a growth of that kind of monitor. And one more thing I'd add is, how do you pair indoor air quality monitoring with that? So we have a lot of people who are thinking about their exchange rates in their house and how do they better ventilate? So we've got more and more people putting an outdoor purple air and a, pairing it with an indoor purple air so that they can see the differential and see if there are any modifications that they need to do in their home. Like, is it worse outside right now or that kind of thing? So definitely. Um. Is my time. And related to the Kansas campaign, unsurprisingly, uh, the majority of the people, they have to give them back. I mean, they all have to give them back, but the majority of them have expressed disappointment in that. I mean, but they're CSU owned and we have to put, we have other things planned for them. They, that's sort of our mini field campaign type de deployment. And, um, but yeah, I mean, our hope is we give them the information on how to acquire their own at this point. And they're $250, $250. So, I think that's awesome. I mean, because now you've incited interest and talking to the people in the community um, that that didn't suggest people to give the air quality monitor to well, because they were so sensitive. It's a sensitive topic. There's air quality, and then there's we need fire on the landscape in order to, to live, to keep our fuels under control. So it was so sensitive, they're like, I'm not suggesting anybody. I'm like, well, you're the best person. They're like, I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna go there. And there was one more question back there. So that's great that there's, because you want to do what half FOMO. Uh, yeah. One one thing uh, I would love, there's a question in the, okay. the chat here. And because they're not in person and the opportunity to talk after, I would love to get to this question. That sounds possible. great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So question for the entire panel. What is one piece of information that you don't have now, but wish you did? and think you could have that would allow you to more effectively communicate to the public the risks of an individual wildfire. Cassie, do you want to take that? Sure. Here. Sorry, one piece of information we don't have now, but we wish we did. I think um, one thing I wish we had more of was like we're talking about getting more of those low cost sensors out and it also incorporating the interpolation, the satellite data. Like I wish we had that awesome spatial map so we could really pinpoint the effects and that might make it a lot more relatable for individuals and the localized impacts. So it feels like we're getting there with these kind of conversations that lead towards integration. 
next. That was for the whole panel, that question. So, do we want to start like this? Then? Steve, did, uh, you, did you have anything that you so, know in your dreams? Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think what's the, what's the right one. I was thinking along wildfires, but more along active wildfires, which is not the focus of this group. Um, but it's pertinent. Yes, it's pertinent. Uh, so one thing that doesn't exist right now that I'm aware of is an active wildfire risk. So, you know, there is a wildfire risk, which tells you kind of what's the general uh, probability that a wildfire will, will occur in a given area, but there's also the risk that an active fire will impact your particular location. And I'm not sure that that kind of uh, risk uh, exists right now. I know there's some NASA folks working on uh, understanding you know, the, the probability that an active fire may impact your particular location. And we also have from the last HAPS, uh, we do have work on the smoke maps with US uh, Forest Service that we know of when the smoke plumes are the next 48 hours. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that was a HAPS project. Okay, cool. And, and NIFC and NWCG put up maps um, so if NIFC could working in a local area. They tell the local community, you know, because you have to evacuate. So, and satellites are definitely used for that, especially GOES now because it's five yep. minute data, yep. even though it's not so geographically accurate. Um, so, NIFC is really good at that, and the WCG maps too. And then the whole linkage of, of um, air quality, now casting, and forecasting with demographics and the whole medical community. Understanding the health equity impacts of wildfire smoke, for instance, requires a lot of assessment of the, of the data that's out there. You know, like like uh, one of the guys was saying, you can't just look at the number of people that checked into the hospital that day. Um, that's not really the measure. It's the long term. Yeah, and what they came out with in our health data is yeah. not that great, even the syndrome and surveillance. Kevin, did you, that brings you right in? Sure. Yeah, from the health side, we do a pretty good job of knowing if it's a huge fire and you can't see the sun or there's no fire, all those in between days, and we have better resolution on the real health risk and get those that communication scaled appropriately. Yeah, any ideas of a desire? But, um, if you if you had a wish list and you, your magic, what one thing would help you move forward? We know how to do the work. It's um, we need to get EPA convinced there's a need for this. Um, they're the ones that lead out on risk communication in general. So this is a work with EPA thing to let them lead out on this. Okay, so risk communication. Do we, I know we're after the hour, but do you want to go ahead and ask it and at least we can all hear it for people that could stay or not stay? So the different attributes of wildfire, because mostly there's two phases which are talks, for example, for health. What is the reaction after that with this cost? Uh, I didn't hear the first part. When you say mm -hmm. social cost, well, when you say social cost, referring to climate social cost efforts or just social no, cost? Social cost, for example, because it's, it's, uh, for the wildfire effects, it's the social cost. Mm -hmm. He probably needs yeah. everything, like losing your trailer. Yeah. As yeah. To, Abraham's yeah. not in the room. He's actually done this as an economist who's at this meeting, he's not in the room. And but Daniel talked about Abraham. We, we've actually done a lot of work on. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, at the federal level, how um, cost benefit analysis is done. Um, the wildfires isn't incorporated anywhere, essentially. It's not in climate, social cost, uh, carbon efforts. It's not really considered in any um, cost or benefit of, of air quality policies. At the state level, we feel the cost on an annual basis if we have to hire more firefighters or smoke jumpers. So states see it when it hits them, but there's no long-term planning for cost, particularly when it hits health. So we need to get the health impacts included in these economic models so states and the federal government have a better picture of what we're really experiencing. But it's absent right now. And in Daniel Tong's talk in the last session here, he, he had a chart that showed his group's 
with Yang's work on that, as well as some earlier studies, and sort of listed which of the costs were included in that. But none of them are nothing yet comprehensive in terms of all of the. It's just the tip of the the pyramid of mortality and hospitalizations, but not loss of work days, loss of school days, loss of community events, those sorts of things. Yeah, fear. I mean, I can think of all kinds of social things that mm -hmm. happen after a fire. Having to move, relocated, not mm -hmm. having a home, and those with less resources. You know, that can the stress impact. And it's a great question. Um, that's a fantastic question. So yeah, and I think it's something that we're all just starting to deal with. And it was only a couple of years ago that the Forest Service, their funding, if it was a big fire year, it was taken away from research. Research that would help the firefighters, that would help air quality, that would help health. And so now they have their own budget, but that's new. It's just a few years, literally, I think three. So we're all growing. And possibly we can get a federal comment about this because I think more federal organizations are getting funding and being forced to play together well in the same box. Yeah, exactly. So like, I, you know, very briefly mentioned in the opening remarks about now NASA has entire wildfire applications, dedicated focus here that launches this year. And it goes beyond that, that NASA as a whole is looking to develop a, a program known as Fire Sense that's going to actually unite NASA wildfire research, NASA wildfire applications, actually uh, assets from our aeronautics division, as well as bringing, of course, the other agencies as well to have a coordinated uh, wildfire research and application and monitoring effort. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And that's going to be, of course, a long term, long term project. Uh, but I just want to also say this was an awesome panel. I am so, so grateful of how it was organized and put together, having, you know, academia, the city of Fort Collins and private sector and Steve, I did an awesome uh, webinar with Bree Zomber several months ago with Paul Walsh, and so, so glad you could be here. Um, totally apropos of nothing, except I've been wondering about it ever since I saw Cassie's uh, Fort Collins visibility cam. And what does the A on the hillside stand for? Ah. <laughs> right. Do you want to take it or go? Oh, either Jeff or I, <laughs> or both Fort Collins. Um, but it's, it's an A for Aggies, so it's actually related to CSU. Um, originally, at Lang Grant University, they're called the Aggies, is as much as I know about it. And every year, um, I believe the football team goes and repaints the A on the hill to reinforce that. Jeff might have more to add. It's the Rams. It is nothing A for. <laughs> <laughs> Started as a Colorado AM. We switched to Colorado AM. Oh, okay. Okay. The best question of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering who said that. I let it go out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for an awesome town. We're a little over, but this was really good, right? Thank you.